have you ever stopped to think about where the food you eat comes from? How the apple in your lunch makes its way from the orchard to your house? That's the story of the food supply chain, and that's the topic we're going to explore in this video. At the simplest level, the food supply chain refers to the series of processes and stages that food products go through from their initial production to their final consumption and disposal. The food supply chain encompasses all of the activities, organizations, resources, and actors involved in transforming raw agricultural materials into finished food products that are delivered to the consumer. It can be divided into several key stages, each playing a crucial role in ensuring the availability, quantity, and safety of food. The chain begins with production, which includes not just farming and cultivation of crops, but also livestock production and even the harvesting of fish and seafood from the oceans, rivers, and aquaculture facilities. After production, the food item moves to processing, where the raw agricultural products are turned into the forms that are suitable for consumption. Depending upon the product, this can be relatively simple, like sorting and cleaning oranges, or it can be incredibly complex, like turning raw materials into frozen meals. After processing and packaging, the food item moves on to the next stage in the process, distribution, where it's moved from the processing facilities to retailers. Depending upon the foods being transported and the distance traveled, this may be relatively simple, like loading produce onto a truck for sale at a farmer's market, or incredibly complex, like flying high-value food products from far-flung regions of the world to high-end restaurants. Next, food is purchased through retail outlets, which can range from restaurants and cafeterias to grocery stores and farmer's markets to nearly anything in between. And finally, it reaches the final consumer. Through this process, food makes its way from the farmer to the consumer, while money makes its way back from the consumer purchasing the apple, ultimately back to the farmer that grew it. But to be clear, this does not mean that the farmers capture all of the money spent on food. Indeed, they don't even capture a majority of it. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service, for every dollar spent on food in the United States, less than eight cents went back to the farmer that grew the food. And that's not profit, that's gross revenue from which all farm expenses, including input costs like seed and feed and fertilizer, must be paid. About 17 cents was spent on processing, with about 14 cents of every dollar going to processing and a little less than 3% spent on packaging. The distribution stage of the value chain claims about 14 cents of every dollar, with about 3.5 cents of that going to transportation, and about 10.7 cents being spent on the wholesale food trade. The retail stage claims the largest share of the food dollar, with about 46.5 cents of every dollar spent going to retail. And finally, all other expenses, including energy costs, finance, insurance, legal and accounting services, advertising, and so on, claim about 14 cents of every food dollar. Let's explore each of these stages in a bit more detail to get a more complete picture of what each entails, and let's start at the beginning of the food supply chain, at the level of production. Here there are three primary types of activities. Farming is the process of cultivating the land for the production of crops or rearing of animals for food, fiber, or other products. It generally involves planting, cultivating, harvesting, and storing of crops, or raising and caring of animals, generally for the production of meat, dairy, eggs, fibers, or other animal products. As we'll consider in another video, farming can range from small-scale family farming and subsistence activities to large-scale industrial operations on a massive scale, earning multiple millions of dollars per year. Ranching is the practice of raising or grazing livestock animals, like cattle, sheep, and horses, on large tracts of land. It involves grazing animals on natural or cultivated pastures, herding, breeding, and managing livestock to produce meat, wool, or other animal products. While ranching can take place at a variety of scales, from small-scale family operations to large-scale industrial ones, the economies of scale for livestock production generally lead to larger operations involving large areas of land with extensive grazing operations. And finally, fishing is the activity of harvesting, catching, or raising aquatic animals, primarily fish or shellfish, a broad category that includes everything from shrimp, lobster, and crabs, to clam, oysters, mussels, and scallops. Fishing can encompass a variety of activities and techniques, ranging from line and net fishing to large-scale industrial trawlers to fish grazed in controlled environments, generally referred to as aquaculture. Food processing can be classified into three main categories, each of which involves different techniques and objectives, ultimately transforming raw agricultural materials into consumable food products. 
Primary food processing involves the initial steps of transforming raw agricultural materials into forms that are suitable for consumption or further processing. This stage focuses on the basic preparation and preservation of food items, like cleaning, removing dirt, debris, and contaminants from raw materials, sorting and grading, categorizing raw materials based on size, quality, and other attributes, shelling and husking, or removing the outer coverings from nuts, grains, and seeds, butchering, slaughtering of animals, and initial cutting of livestock into primal cuts, milking, extracting milk from dairy animals, or milling, grinding grains into flour and other forms. In other words, primary processing might include activities like washing and peeling fruits and vegetables, shelling and drying nuts and seeds, milling wheat into flour, or pasteurizing milk to make it safe for final consumption. Secondary food processing involves transforming primary processed foods into more complex food products. This stage typically involves combining ingredients and applying various techniques to produce a wide range of food items, including mixing different ingredients to create new food products, cooking by baking, boiling, frying, roasting, and so on, fermentation, which is the process of microorganisms to which is the process of using microorganisms to transform foods like producing yogurt, cheese, beer, or preserving using methods like canning, freezing, or drying to extend the shelf life of food. And finally, tertiary food processing involves the production of ready-to-eat or ready-to-heat food products. This stage often focuses on convenience and value-added products that require minimal preparation by consumers. This can include cooking or pre-cooking meals so that they can be readily and quickly reheated, packaging finished product for retail sales, adding flavor, seasonings, and preservatives to enhance taste and shelf life, and portioning food into individual sizes for immediate consumption. For the most part, the more processed a food item is, the greater the proportion of the sale price captured by the processors. An apple generates less profit for the processors than a ready-to-eat microwavable meal. Similarly, a prepackaged salad can be sold for a higher price than less processed leafy greens that can be used to make it. And while processing is more convenient and can improve shelf life, potentially reducing waste and helping ensure product availability throughout the year, it also comes with several negatives. Processed foods often contain high amounts of added sugar, salt, and unhealthy fats, which can contribute to obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, and other chronic diseases, and many processed foods contain artificial ingredients like preservatives, colors, and flavors, which can have potential health risks. The most processed foods, so-called ultra-processed foods, or UPFs, often contain a long list of ingredients, including artificial additives. Research suggests that high consumption of UPFs is associated with increased risk of chronic diseases like obesity, heart disease, and cancer. Finally, processing also tends to increase the amount of packaging, which can contribute to environmental pollution and waste management problems. The distribution and logistics stage of the food chain provides the crucial link between food production and consumption. It involves the complex processes of transporting, storing, and managing food products from the point of origin like farms and processing plants to the point of sale like food retailers and restaurants. Food products are transported using a variety of methods including trucks, ships, airlines, and trains. The choice of transport depends on factors like the distance traveled, the type of food being transported, and the urgency of the shipment. For the most part, airplanes are used for the transport of high-value, perishable, and time-sensitive goods requiring rapid delivery. Think of fresh fish or cut flowers transported from Africa to Europe and North America. Ships are most often used for international and long-distance transport of bulk and non-perishable items. Trains are commonly used for transporting large quantities of food over long distances within continents, while trucks are normally used for short and medium-distance deliveries to local food retailers. Advances in cold chain logistics and temperature-controlled supply chains involving refrigerated storage and transport to prevent spoilage and maintain food safety have permitted the development of year-round production and consumption of perishable items like dairy, meat, and fresh produce. This is important for a couple of reasons. First, it has permitted the distancing of food production and consumption. A commonly cited figure is that the average meal travels 2,000 miles from farm to fork, leading to the concept of food miles. And while there's some debate over the accuracy of this figure, it nevertheless highlights the way in which the modern food supply chain has permitted the globalization of food production. Our local grocery stores contain ingredients sourced from around the world, bananas from Central and South America, coffee from South America, Africa, and Asia, chocolate from West Africa, olive oil from Europe, tea from South Asia, and so on. It's also obviated the idea of seasonality. 
Gone are the days when consumers could only find strawberries in the spring, or oranges in the winter, or squash in the fall, and so on. Instead, fruit and vegetables can often be found throughout the year, as the site of production can be shifted from countries in the global north to the global south and back again to maintain year-round provisioning. But for all these benefits, the globalized system of food distribution comes with some risks and consequences as well. Supply chain disruptions caused by natural disasters, pandemics, or geopolitical conflicts can disrupt the supply chain, causing delays and shortages. A prime example of this were the food shortages resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted from significant disruptions in the global supply chain affecting transportation and labor availability. The globalization of food supply chains can also have real environmental impacts, though this has to be weighed against the environmental impact of local production. One study, for example, found that the carbon emissions associated with apple production in the United Kingdom were significantly greater than growing apples in New Zealand and shipping them to the UK for consumption. But the environmental impact of other transportation methods, particularly air transport, is much greater. The retail stage of the food supply chain is the point where food products are sold to the consumer. This stage divides into two categories, broadly centering on food at home and food away from home. Historically, the majority of food spending, and by extension food consumption, in the United States was on food consumed at home, purchased from grocery stores and similar outlets. However, this has been changing. In the 1960s, Americans spent about three-quarters of their food budget on meals at home, while food away from home represented about one-quarter of total spending. Today, American spending on food is evenly divided. Indeed, in 2022, the most recent year for which data is currently available, Americans spent a little more than $1 billion on food eaten at home and about $1.3 billion on food eaten away from home. The Department of Agriculture further disaggregates this spending. Of the $1 billion spent in 2022 on food spent at home, the majority comes from retail grocery stores and supermarkets, which offer a wide range of food products including fresh produce, dairy, meat, packaged foods, and so on. This category includes both traditional grocery stores like Kroger, Albertsons, and Safeway, which is owned by Albertsons and Winco, which account for more than half of all food purchases. It also includes specialty grocers like Aldi, Trader Joe's, and Whole Foods, as well as specialty shops focused on specific foods like bakeries, butcheries, fish markets, and so on, which together comprise about 10 to 15 percent of all food purchases. And finally, it includes warehouse clubs like Costco and Sam's Club, which represent about 20% of food purchases. Convenience stores are smaller stores that offer a limited selection of food products, usually focusing on snacks, beverages, and ready eat items. They account for a smaller share, but growing share, of food purchases, estimated to be about 2% of all consumption. E-commerce platforms that sell food products online, offering home delivery services, as well as large online grocery stores and subscription meal kits are a growing segment of the food at home market, representing a little less than 10% of all food at home. This segment picked up significantly after the COVID-19 lockdowns. And finally, all other sources represent about 1% of food consumed at home. As for food away from home, a little less than 40% is spent at full-service restaurants in which customers are serviced by waitstaff. This includes fine dining restaurants like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse or the Capitol Grill, casual dining chains like Olive Garden or Chili's, and thousands of independent sit-down restaurants. A similar amount is spent on limited-service restaurants, which are establishments offering quick service where customers generally order and pay at the counter. Unlike full-service restaurants where food is almost always eaten on site, limited-service restaurants may serve food eaten on premises, takeout, or delivered. This includes fast food chains like McDonald's, In-N-Out, and Taco Bell, fast casual chains like Chipotle and Panera, and pizza delivery services like Domino's and Pizza Hut. Drinking places like bars, pubs, lounges, and nightclubs are generally engaged in preparing and selling alcoholic beverages for immediate consumption and generally serve limited food items comprising about 1% of the food eaten away from home. Food service provided by hotels represents about 5% of food away from home, Recreational places comprise about 4% of food away at home. This includes amusement parks like Disneyland's and Six Flags, concession stands at sports stadiums, and food courts at recreational facilities like movie theaters. Schools and colleges serve about 6% of the meals eaten away from home, including cafeterias in K-12 schools, colleges, and university dining halls, and on-campus food courts and cafes. Finally, all other sources, ranging from food trucks to vending machines to catered events and beyond, comprise about 6% of food eaten away from home. A variety of challenges arise in the retail stage of the food supply chain. 
In recent years, consolidation has reduced competition in the retail sector. This has often resulted in higher prices for consumers and greater pressure on suppliers and distributors. Redlining, the historical practice of denying or limiting access to healthy foods and affordable food options in specific neighborhoods, often based on racial or socioeconomic factors, has contributed to the development of food deserts in poorer neighborhoods. This is typically done by large supermarket chains who choose not to locate their stores in these areas, leaving residents with limited access to fresh produce, meats, and other essential food items, and forcing them to secure food from convenience stores. Redlining has a variety of impacts on the affected communities. In addition to limiting access to fresh and nutritious foods, it also tends to result in higher food prices, higher rates of diet-related diseases, and fewer economic opportunities in the neighborhood, creating a vicious cycle of poverty. Retailers contribute to food waste through practices like discarding unsold or imperfect produce and overstocking perishable items. But that's it for now. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and thanks for watching.